Oh, there you go. Um, <laughs> alrighty, so types of partnerships. Obviously, we've got this webinar called Working Together. Um, working together means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, you hear working together, you, you know, sometimes your mind jumps to, you know, okay, that means it needs to be a massive sports hub. Um, it needs to be, you know, an amalgamation of clubs. Um, it needs to be, you know, may, maybe moving locations, all these different types of things. Um, working together, as you can see from this model here, um, that's been pieced together by Active and, and the um, Auckland Sports RST um, partners, um, it can take, you know, various different forms. Um, you know, it can be something as easy, easy as having an MOU, an informal agreement, um, to a formal agreement whereby you just, you know, look to work work with each other where possible. Um, it can be a co-location, so having more than one um, entity working out of the same facilities. Um, as, as you can see, you know, sh shared services, um, shared management, and then you kind of get to, you can get to that bigger scale where you actually go to like maybe like we said that full amalgamation, or you start looking to do those kind of multi-sport hubs. Um, so I guess what we're trying to say or show you here is it can be working together can be as big or as small as you want it to be, um, and it shouldn't be something that you think necessarily oh you're not ready for or it's this big big scary thing. Um, so. I mean, we can we can share this working together model um, with you after this after the webinar if you want to have a bit of a look through it. But it's more of just a a chance to show you the different types of ways that you can be working together and kind of just get you thinking um, about about what you could be doing um, in your current situation. So I guess that brings us naturally on to um, a bit of a discussion piece. Um, so we might just I'll just kind of put it out to the open floor and and if you're comfortable asking answering this question that'd be awesome but I guess um, you know what are you looking for out of a partnership um, and maybe it's something that made you come on this call today or maybe it's just something that you've kind of been thinking about in the background it might even be some discussions you've already started having um, within your club um, or, or with other organizations so I'm just gonna put that question out there um, if someone's keen to answer that'd be awesome um, but yeah what, what are you looking for out of a partnership um, when you are kind of floating around in that space of, of working together. Um, well, I'll, I'll throw out um, one thing for, for me, it would be um, sort of um, pulling together to be able to get um, better learning opportunities for our, our sports in our areas. So, you know, you know, perhaps there's a workshop on something like, you know, mental well-being and sports and things like that, and you can get somebody in for, with a bigger crowd but not with the smaller ones. So sharing resources in that way um, could be beneficial across codes. Absolutely. Is that something you guys have looked to do or have done? Um, it's something that I'm looking into from our umpiring side of things. We're looking at things like mental well-being, um, you know, dealing with conflict, things like that, the sort of stuff that umpires and referees just kind of uh, get thrown at on, on their weekend sport, which isn't always nice, but giving them the tools to be able to um, deal with those in a way that, you know, they're not actually... Um, turned away from the sport because they've had such a terrible experience that they don't know how to overcome it. Um, um, but as well as also looking at resources for the wider community to to stop issues like that happening in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. And have you, like, did that come out of having discussions with other people in the community or other people from different organisations? Um, no, I, well, I'm, I've been in netball for probably, I don't know, 15 years now over at Howard Pakaranga, and I, I also am associated with some of the other netball centres around Auckland and Counties Manukau, and I know that it's a key thing, but my role for most of that 15 year has been about umpire development and, um, you know, growing the pool of people and, and growing the sport of netball through that. And I just see it as a, as a, an area of need 
Um, awesome. And, you know, I'm, tr I'm exhausting my options and I can see that there's other potential options out there, but they kind of cater for really large groups or um, much higher, you know, professional league sort of thing. And it's <laughs> like we, ne we need to sort of get like back down at that lower level and, and fill some gaps in there to be able to keep people to get to a higher level. Absolutely. No, that, that's really cool. And that's probably something that could, um, you know, before we get to the next slide, that, that's something you definitely identify as a, as a driver for change. You know, you've, you've identified that there is, is an issue and, and you've gone about um, thinking about a, a solution um, to kind of make that happen, not over, only for your benefit of your organisation, but it, recognising that a lot of other people are in the same boat. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the genesis of, of what a lot of these working together type um, projects are, are born out of. So that's, that's really cool. Um, has anyone else um, got something to share around what they might be looking for out of, out of a partnership? I think for, for sports, we, in sports clubs, we quite often work in isolation and, and we, we create our own little silos and the opportunity to work together is to just solve common issues. You know, even though we're all in different sports, we, we actually as clubs or as organisations have common issues and, and, you know, something that I, I've got to resolve or try and find a solution for the club you know, 200 metres away from me might have already had that problem and solved it. So that, that collaboration, that communication between the clubs helps resolve those and, you know, makes life a little bit easier for all of us. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Um, problem shared, problem halved. And, and yeah, like you say, there's a lot of knowledge out there in the community and, and having those discussions and, um, and leaning on each other can be really beneficial for, for everyone. Any, anyone else got in, uh, anything to add to um, add to this question around what you might be looking for out of a partnership? Um, um, I can say oh, something. sorry. Hey, Jack. Uh, hey, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I know for me, so seeing as I'm now working a bit more into the, into the club sector, um, being a bit more, uh, maybe being a bit more aware and getting examples of, like, as the guy said before, um, organizations that people have have or can collaborate with, um, because then I could potentially do something and collaborate and work together with somebody within my, um, within my community. Um, so again, not necessarily, you know, re reinventing the wheel, but I'm sure there are plenty of organizations out there that I don't necessarily know about because I've worked in a, um, you know, just in a, in a, in a bigger region, basically. So now I'm, I want to get a little bit more uh, specific. Um, I am aware of, for instance, act activation in my community, uh, but I'm sure there's plenty of others that, that we can work with and um, that club um, collaborated with and, you know, again, just each yeah, absolutely. Um, from um, from what I caught of that, yeah, your internet is is breaking up a little bit, but I, I definitely got the got the crux of what you're saying there, and I I would encourage you. I guess that's where where Sport Auckland um, could and and should be um, stepping in there, and I'd encourage you to catch up with Sam um, outside of this webinar because he's our He's our man out in Howick, and he's he is really well connected in with all those um, those clubs and groups and community organisations, and um, definitely agree what you're kind of getting at around if you can have some sort of community of practice out there to connect with, um, you're already a step in the right direction um, for sure. Awesome. What we might do now? That's really good discussion, guys, and, and all really um, really positive contributions. We might just um, might just keep on moving. Um, I'll pass this over to Sam. Um, as he kind of goes on to speak to some of the reasons or some that, that can be drivers for change um, and I guess a little nudge um, along that working together um, journey. So over to you, Sam. Thanks, Rory. Um, so just off the back of what you guys were saying, there's um, initially I have some a similar list basically of, of why we should be collaborating. Um, 
drivers for change, as I'm calling it. Um, the first one is lifestyle and societal themes are changing. When uh, first of all, there's professional and commercial um, themes around which that is happening. It's an increasing area of sports services are being produced and sold as fitness products. So, and that's coming at a cost to um, to uh, traditional sport clubs. Um, and this, it's a challenge that has to be overcome. Um, next, there's volunteering. Um, there's greater expectations on fewer volunteers, which is making volunteering kind of unattractive and compliance harder to achieve. Um, uh, volunteers are often older members and their capacity uh, is being exhausted. Um, next is uh, there's changing demographics, um, which there's a big uh, um, big infographic on right on this slide. Uh, it's changing every which way you can imagine. Um, there's uh, um, an overall aging population and an increasing generation gap. Uh, there's significant increases in the percentage of people who identify as Asian, especially in Auckland. Um, Stephanie talked about the age active Asian um, in Howick, which we do work on, um, and that's uh, becoming an increasing part of uh, the sporting culture. Um, uh, then there's compliance requirements, which are health and safety, uh, managing financial risks are demanding, and all of that for a single volunteer-based club is really difficult to handle. Um, aging sport infrastructure is, um, is another piece that um, the current network of facilities across uh, New Zealand are, are roughly at about um, the end of their useful life if I may call it that, um, and that's obviously anecdotal evidence, but we do come across um, that kind of conversation quite often. Um, lots of sport club rooms are quite hard to uh, maintain and manage, um, as you guys would probably testify. Um, and obviously working together helps um, those kind of issues uh, a lot. Uh, sustainability has uh, diminished um, because there's uh, changes to the way that people participate. Uh, sport has become personalized and is enabled increasingly by technology. Um, there's consumerism and choice-oriented society with um, a focus on novelty. So people move from place to place. They don't really necessarily take up a membership of one sport club, um, which, uh, which again, comes at a cost to the traditional sport club. So again, working together provides different options to that member, which helps to keep them in one place. Um, so yeah, that's just a few drivers for change that we could think of. There's obviously heaps more. Um, there's far more um, advantages to actually working together than any disadvantages that you could think of. Or, uh, and there's obviously well, ways of working around um, any hurdles that come across, which we'll hear from a few of the speakers as we go along. Um, here's um, a few more benefits. Um, that can be achieved from uh, working together. Um, first is the governance or partnership is definitely going to benefit from uh, combinations of complementary skills of, from different clubs. Um, they provide a wider pool of knowledge, skills and contacts and that's obviously helpful to every club out there. Um, in terms of financial benefits, it immediately reduces operational costs if resources are shared, uh, opens up new income streams, whether that just be um, the bar tab or even funding support or partnership funding um, strategy can ensure that groups do not apply to same the same funder in the same month and undermine each other's proposals. Um, so it basically maximizes the funding that uh, the community can get access to if different clubs come together and apply for funding um, together. Uh, even um, in terms of participation, uh, combined membership models um, have a far higher chance of attracting uh, bigger masses of the community than uh, single clubs. Um, uh, also, uh, working together can tackle collective issues um, that are being constantly faced by community clubs in terms of membership retention, growth, maximizing opportunities. A few of you guys have had chats with around that subject, so I know the challenges um, that you're facing around that region. Um, in terms of administration, obviously there's potential cost and efficiency saving. You, you can employ lesser staff, uh, you can reduce uh, pressure on volunteers by employing a few paid staff, um, just by um, applying to a funder by coming together. 
um, and funders like to see that kind of thing that you are coming together and uh, hence accessing large sections of the community you could probably do um, holiday programs and um, school club things with um, by working together which would uh, stand a far higher chance of getting funded than if your application was just solo um, there's facility development which comes at a higher stage of partnerships um, where you can put in collective input into plans and priorities um, uh, given that a few of you are from how it is the Lloyd Elsmo Park hub that's coming up which um, puts into um, perspective the uh, benefits that can be had from working together and putting all of the codes in one place. Um, Stephanie from Howick Softball uh, also is part of a similar hub uh, where a facility um, hosts uh, three different codes. Um, so there's definitely advantages in terms of facility development if a, a number of clubs were to come together um, and plan for building something specific. Um, it, it's uh, it stands a far better chance of actually reaching completion than if individual co codes were to try and build something up from scratch. So there's huge advantages there. Um, and even if uh, you're not really quite buying into the benefits or the problems, uh, don't have to wait for the problem to arise before you react to it, as you can probably tell uh, from the picture that I'm trying to paint and that it's coming, um, the time is coming that, um, they might be um, the challenges might be too large for individual clubs to handle on their own. So, being pro proactive and preventing problems before they arise might just be um, the best solution. So, it's um, it's best that we start doing it at this stage before it gets too late. Um, yeah. So that's um, that's plenty from me. Um, I will hand over to my colleague Caitlin. Uh, to take you to uh, through a very meaty part of the presentation. So over to you, Caitlin. Fantastic, thanks, Sam. Um, so we've gone over quite a bit so far in terms of what might make us work together and the benefits that can come from it. But I suppose we now need to think a little bit about how we can actually make those things happen. Um, so you'll start to see as we go through a couple of these steps here, is they link back to a few of the bits that have been mentioned earlier. Um, so of course, we went into the drivers for change, uh, could be a problem, could be an opportunity, um, and, and then we've ended up at this point where we're going, hey, we actually wanna start getting something going. So once we've identified that, we really wanna go out and start to gain a better understanding of what is actually out there. So that's going out, talking to our local community, whether that be um, other local groups, clubs, schools, making sure you go talk to your local board, um, and also not forgetting to actually talk to your membership. Plenty of your members will probably be involved in other aspects of your community, and potentially they already know of some other opportunities that may lay out there for you. So once you've done an initial and understanding gather essentially of your surroundings it's time to actually take back your ideas and what opportunities you may have found and see what your committee your boards think of your next steps and your ideas there um, bearing in mind when we're at these early stages it's not necessarily hey this is this is what we're going to do it's going to solve all of our problems it's hey here's some ideas for how we could start to do these these things differently, how we could work with different people to try and gain some of those benefits that Sam went over just previously. So we've done a canvas of what's going on in our community, our committee or our board's pretty happy for us to start to um, really work on getting some of these partnerships underway. The next thing we want to do before we do anything else is actually just check, hey, is there any other alternatives that we've missed? So essentially, we're going back and doing an, a double check on those insights that we gathered. Um, and often, it, this can be a bit easier if we've done that initial insights gather and we've found potential partners. If they've come into the conversation, hey, that actually starts to go, is there also other alternatives, different people that can come into the picture? So, so far, these are really early stages. These are conversations that you're having 
to try and see hey who's out there that we can work with to help both or all of our groups could be multiple of you working together to get some of those benefits um, for most of us that's a pretty good first couple of steps to get through and not always the easiest um, if we have we've found ourselves with a couple of partners to work with we're going to start to move on to to really engaging those partners maybe sitting down having some meatier conversations about what you're going to do together and uh, could even be looking to bring in further partners again um, once you've got there, we will essentially step into, often if you've got multiple groups there, we tend to advise you guys to come up with a MOU or a Memorandum of Understanding to, to all sit down and be on the same page. Um, a challenge that I'm sure a couple of our lovely guest speakers will tell you about um, is getting everybody on the same page isn't easy. Uh, I think Francis even mentioned earlier when we asked you for the drivers a change, sports clubs historically have worked alone. Um, we all have our own ways of doing things. When all of a sudden we open up and try and work with others, there's always going to be a little bit of a learning curve in there. Um, so essentially from there, when we've started our conversations, we start to make some further plans about what we want to do in terms of are we making holiday programs together are we employing staff together all those types of things and there's so many different options out there and this is just a really important point that i want to reiterate this cycle that you can see on your screen um, isn't the be all and end all you don't have to get all the way through you may notice that when we get to about step eight it says build which can often make people think oh we've got to build something doesn't literally mean you need to build a building <laughs> okay um, that could simply be a we're building a, a partnership we're building a strategy here for how we're going to continue to work together the most important part that um, would probably keep saying to go back to after we've got those initial partnerships drawn up is always keep going back to um, why are we why are we partnering what are we wanting to achieve how can we keep doing this better if we have two clubs starting out together, there's no reason to say, hey, after a couple of months, well, this is what we want to achieve. We can bring more people in to help us achieve that. Um, like anything, we always say you learn something new every day. And that's definitely true when we start to branch out and, and work together in the sports sector. Um, I suppose that's enough from me for now because you'll be getting sick of my voice as well. Uh, it's just a really basic understanding of how we start to, to develop these partnerships. And to give you a better idea on how that works in the real world, um, we've got some awesome speakers to, to tell you about their experiences. Um, so I'm going to welcome Francis from How Pickering a Cricket to uh, give you a bit of background on working with Buckland's Beach Football Club. Welcome, Francis. Hello. Um, so based on background, I mean, a lot of you are from East Auckland and Howick. So, you know, we are based at Lord Alsmore Park and the cricket club's in a very uh, good position that we uh, own our facility. So we've got quite a big facility. It's been there for 20 years. Um, yeah, it's a big facility. It costs a lot to run um, and it is one of the better facilities that you'll find around. Uh, the challenge for our club uh, a few years ago was that obviously we're a summer sport. Um, the facility is jam-packed through um, summer, but is or was sitting empty through winter. So our training centre is, is 12 months of the year, but our pavilion uh, was sitting empty. So through through an array of conversations, Bucklands Beach Football uh, were playing playing games at um at lord Ellsmore park their uh, home ground though is actually based down at eastern beach at rogers park uh, and there was some discussions four or five years ago about uh the football club um if you like creating a, a partnership with us where they use our facilities um through the winter months um the conversation came around uh luckily and as, as you'll find with a lot of your clubs um that are close together is that you'll have a lot of overlap of members 
and we were lucky to have an overlap of members, people having a conversation, uh, conversations identified common problems, um, and then common problems led to common solutions. And so about, it was about 2017, we entered into an agreement. So we have got a memorandum of understanding um, with the Bucklands Beach, where from 1st of April through to the 30th of September, um, they use our pavilion. Um, the benefits for both clubs, it gives them a, should we say, a nice flash facility to use, uh, located by their, by their number one. Um, it gives them a lot of opportunities. We've got a commercial kitchen. Uh, we've got a bar set up. Um, yeah, look, we, we manage the facility, um, so, so it takes away any hassle uh, from them. Um, for us, it essentially gives us a, a tenant, so it gives us a stream of income um, through the winter months um, and ensures that that facility is, is actually being used, so it's not sitting, sitting empty. Um, so for the two clubs, it was really, they had a problem about where their, their actual facility was. Um, we had a problem with, a, with an empty facility, and, and through the conversations, we, we resolved that. Um, the partnership works uh, really well. It does have its its challenges, um, and and that really just comes around. You know, we, we have slightly different philosophies in terms of how we use the, the facility, um, but but the the overall is that it it, it works well. Um, some of the benefits we we can manage things like bar licenses and the bar and the management of the bar. Um, we do some of their some of their financial management um, for what they do within it, so it saves them. Um, at the same time, um, you know, the costs that all the income we get from them enables us to actually maintain the facility because owning a facility is, is expensive uh, to manage. Um, other benefits for us, is, especially when it comes to funding, um, when we put in funding applications now, we can say we are a community facility. So if we're, if we're looking for funding, you know, we're, we're getting our nets upgraded at the moment. It's not just the cricket club, it's actually a community or, you know, community building that we are we are doing, so it makes our funding applications uh, look really good. Um, so that helps us out uh, quite quite a bit as well. Um, Sam's given me some questions here, which I'll, I'll try to jump into. Um, future, the future, I'd say, is is potential. Um, we've already had some conversations. Um, the football club have have people in certain roles. We've got people in in other roles uh, and employed. And so it's working, potentially working out what that might look like for both clubs going forward. Um, sponsorship uh, is one thing. You know, obviously, a sponsorship proposal looks better if it's got uh, 2,000 members attached to it instead of 1,200 and 800. Um, as mentioned earlier, timing of funding applications. Um, if, we, if we've had success getting funding from one organisation for one type of project, you know, can we let Bucklands Beach know that and that they, can, they can try and get that, that funding as well? Um, and the other one is is admin. So I think one of the challenges I'll, I'll jump back to when when you're looking at sports working together is if you're like when we're when we're talking specifically about our sports, we might have quite different philosophies, and and certainly football and cricket are quite different in terms of how we how we approach sport and you know how how we manage things on the field and around our development programs and the likes. Sitting in behind that though, we do a lot of very common things. And that is, you know, the likes, we, we both have someone doing our accounts. Uh, we both have um, you know, someone checking the, checking the letterbox. You know, we, we, we're two clubs, we've got two different um, post office boxes, um, things like that. So there's a lot of opportunities going forward to start looking at, at what, what savings, or what resources we can share um, to really make both clubs more efficient and, you know, where the cricket club's got downtime for its staff, can, can, we, can we assist football more? And equally, when football's got downtime uh, with their staff, you know, can, can they help us in some way? So there's some real opportunities uh, going forward. Um, and as I said right at the start, it was about, this all really came about through conversation, communication, just having chats, um, solving problems. Um, you know, what, what problem have we got? What problem has someone else had that, that we can solve? Um, we, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll look to collaborate as well. I don't, I don't think it's not like, this is obviously a big thing, um, ha having an agreement in place and sharing a facility, but um, I'd certainly hope that, uh, you know, any of the clubs around Lord Ellsmore can, can give us a call if they ever need anything and we can just have conversations and catch-ups. Uh, we're, we're located quite close to the athletics club, um, so we quite often have a conversation with them and, and keep them up to date. And uh, there is a sports hub, discussion going on at Lord Ellsmore Park and there's also the Lord Ellsmore 
uh, users group as well. So there's, there's lots of chances just to have conversations and, and get people talking, which I think is the, the key to getting all this started. Awesome. So while we've uh, still got you on, Francis, does anyone have any questions for Francis while he's here? Francis, do you have um, paid bar staff and things like that at the cricket club? Uh, yep. So uh, we, we we do have we have a bar license, which is for the facility. So the bar license is is under the name of the cricket club, yep. uh, and we manage throughout the year. We have yeah, we don't have full time bar staff. We have part time and casual bar staff through both the the summer and winter 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 months. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so again, yeah, just on that, I suppose one of the advantages in the Memorandum of Understanding, we, we have given Bucklands Beach members reciprocal membership to the cricket club. Uh, so one, one of the advantages of that is within the bar license, within our club license, everyone from the football club is considered a member of the Howick Packeranga Cricket Club, uh, which means we don't have to operate under two separate licenses throughout the year. We can operate under one. Awesome, thanks heaps for that, Francis. Is there any other questions for Francis before um, we let him move on there? No? Awesome. Um, so unfortunately we were to have a, another speaker join us, but they've been held up with a few things. So I'll send their apologies on their behalf. Um, but luckily for you all, um, I've got a decent amount of knowledge on this particular partnership. Um, so to give you a bit of an idea about what's happening, I can give you a bit of a rundown and you'll start to see uh, where they're moving to in terms of that working together model that we showed you at the beginning. So we were going to have a speaker um, come and speak to you from Marist Rugby Club. Um, they were representing a group of three clubs who are working together. So that's themselves, Marist Rugby, along with Riverside Sports and Pamela Squash. Um, now to give you a bit of background, both Marist Rugby and Riverside Sports are located on the same uh, park in Mount Wellington. They literally just have a car park between the two current clubhouses. Uh, Pamela Squash are about a two minute drive down the road and um, they have come into the partnership, which was because of a large driver for change. Um, so that driver for change came in the form of Pamela Squash needing to vacate their building at the end of their lease, which is due to, to expire in a couple of years time, um, with the building no longer being suitable for them to stay in. Um, and this lends itself to that first part of how do we get a partnership started? Uh, Pamela Squash Club reached out to ourselves at Sport Auckland. Uh, we already had connections with both Riverside and Marist to help them with some other work. And the suggestion was made, hey, they're just down the road for you. Maybe we can start to have a conversation and there could be something um, here for us to work with. So um, fast forward a couple of months and the three clubs sat down and started to have a conversation, realised some of the, the obstacles that they were currently all struggling through as separate clubs was the same and really what they wanted to achieve was the same at the end of the day, um, albeit done through different vehicles and different codes. So um, Sport Auckland has obviously been there to help them along. Um, though that's not to say there hasn't been challenges along the way. Each of the clubs has a rather different membership base and uh, the number of, of members is quite variable between the three. Um, at times when we're starting to get into this partnership, we realise that that can actually make things quite difficult because some of the clubs with a larger membership can often think that, hey, maybe we have more sway in the conversation because we've got more to offer. Um, not always the case. Uh, sometimes the smaller clubs have been around for a long time. There's a lot of knowledge there. So after tonighting through their initial challenges, they've 
got themselves together, they have realized that they all agree on what they want to do, which is a very long term vision of creating a a new home for Pamuir Squash at the Mount Wellington Memorial Reserve where Riverside and Marist are currently located. Um, knowing that if they don't start working together now and being proactive, they're not even going to make it to that. They have decided to start doing things already in the form of Riverside and Marist have already managed to, to share um, their facilities that they currently have in terms of they've got Ripper Rugby happening on turfs when fields are closed, they've got um, spillover changing rooms happening in the Riverside club rooms, really small things that, that don't seem like a lot, but when we turn around and say, well, if, if you weren't working together, what would happen to those kids that came down to play Ripper Rugby on that Friday night? They'd get turned away. So that's 100 kids in that community that would have missed out if these two clubs couldn't start working together. Um, so presently where they're at is the three clubs had started to do a couple of informal sharing in that respect um, and are moving forward to start to formalise that partnership and look to, hey, how can we actually have an offering of a shared membership? How can we start to, to actually share staff, potentially run things through one umbrella organisation? Um, they're, they're still at that early stage of their partnership. Um, like we say, there's still going to be plenty of challenges along the way, but it's, it's great to see that just those small wins where we get to see that, hey, those, those awesome people in our community are getting the opportunities that we really are there for them to get, which is to be active and, and to stay healthy. Um, so that's a little background on, on those three there. And uh, we hope to see them keep working together and, and keep benefiting um, as they move forward. So has anyone got any questions that hopefully I might be able to answer about the partnership there with, with Riverside, Marist and Pamuir Squash? Or if there's any others at all about working together models, feel free to fire them at us. Yeah, I guess um, I've just got kind of one thing to put out there and, and kind of what I've been gleaning from both what you were saying, Francis, and, and also you, Caitlin, thanks for explaining that situation. Um, it's just around, you know, like the, this whole working together thing, it's not all smooth sailing, you know, like you like we've kept saying, you've got two different organisations with their own kind of culture and values and, and what they bring with them. Um, and you know things can look absolutely immaculate and, and the most common sense thing on paper um, but when you go to do them uh, the reality often you know there's lots of things that pop up along the way um, so you know I guess off the back of that like it doesn't seem as though it's not always going to be easy um, but if you get it right um, it's definitely worth it um, and it's going to have a greater impact for your communities um, there's a whole lot more upside if you get it right um, than if you sit sit on your hands and wait for something to happen to you. Um, I definitely encourage and advocate for um, being proactive, taking control of your own destiny, um, and always looking to grow and evolve um, the position that your organisation is sitting in. Um, so, with that being said, is there any you know, is there any sort of actions um, that anyone has been thinking about that they might want to take? Um, obviously, we've heard about um, where netball and, and softball's thinking was at. Um, is there anyone else had something they're thinking about or something that off the back of this um, webinar they might want to go and action themselves, even if it's just a conversation? Um, <clears throat> sorry, um, uh, Rory, I was about to say, obviously, before, um, but... Um, I think somebody wanted to speak, but as uh, Rory knows, and um, you know, few few people in Sport Auckland know also, uh, we we started working with um, just um, uh, a, a primary school just opposite our club, um, basically with uh, sub support from Sport Auckland. Um, it's a very lowly decile school, and um, uh, it's been going pretty well. 
Um, the, the boys and girls have been coming in uh, using facilities in our club uh, for the last uh, two and a half months. And um, pretty much uh, the school um, sports um, people are very happy about, because they're lowly desired school and they just can't afford to pay for it. But uh, kids having to uh, have a few training sessions during the week in the lunch times is um, proving pretty happy is what the feedback I got from Nikki just today. I'm trying to get some info so that I can feed back into this. So it's start of a bigger kind of things that we want to do with different schools around, which um, I've started working with Rory for around a couple of seasons now. And um, this is where we ended up with, and we're going to continue doing it, uh, the school and club relationship. Our focus will be that in the next few seasons. But uh, th thanks to Sport Auckland for supporting this initiative. Awesome. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Um, is there anyone else who, who, who's been thinking about something or um, has got some actions that they might want to take off, off the back of this? Um, at Bridge Park Bowling Club, uh, we've got the football club just up the, in Mungary Mountain, only, only hung a, um, only hung a Mungary football club. Mm. We're having some trouble with their, with their liquor license up there. And as much as I, as I understand it, the, um, uh, the people who control the munga are now trying to uh, make sure that the club don't get their liquor license renewed. So there's conversations that are at the very early stage about the football club may be using the bowling club's facilities. But I, I would kind of like to think that that might be able to go a little bit further than just that, um, which is why I was really interested in what, with what Francis had to say with the connection between a summer sport and a winter sport uh, with Howard Pack Cricket Club. Um, you know, I'd like to think there could be some opportunities for us uh, with the football club. So... I'm going to keep working on that. And Francis, I might come and have a chat with you um, at some stage just to see if we can um, get a bit more detail from you, mate, how it all went. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Uh, that, that's really cool. And, and um, definitely would, would advocate for um, yeah, pursuing that and, and just kind of chunking off that, that low hanging fruit to start with, with um, and always keeping those discussions alive around, you know, it could be something a little bit bigger and, and, um, and go from there. But that's, that's really cool. Um, anything else from you, Sam or Caitlin, just conscious of, of getting you guys away before 8 p.m. Um, and keeping everything running to time? Um, no, I think, uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, uh, just keeping to time. I was uh, uh, yeah, just thinking, Stephanie, uh, you'd mentioned um, working with uh, different people and different clubs and community groups. Um, Charles here, uh, who's, uh, who has the screen name of Matthew, uh, he would be an immediate contact for, uh, for you to start working with, and Charles' community could uh, benefit from uh, the softball club as well. Um, so, yeah, um, did you have any thoughts on that, Stephanie? Um, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, working to just um, to work with more people because we, I mean, we could use a little bit more, you know, help on our end and maybe through collaborating, you know, we can, we can benefit with, you know, others can benefit as well. Um, yeah, so I'd be happy. Is that something we said and we can talk further? Um, I do have a question as well. I was wondering if anybody has any experience um, collaborating, um, whether it be with another group or another club, in terms of getting maybe potentially more volunteers. Um, so volunteers, maybe you know, hey, maybe volunteers to set up a you know an event you know or a tournament like so we have a big tournament every um every year where it um the proceeds go towards um towards breast cancer and, and things like that um you know to always needing umpires and coaches and things like that so does anybody have any experience or any any groups that maybe they've they've worked together with to where they've gotten some some assistance in that sense or I, I'd be keen to keen to know that. Uh, so I personally, outside of sport, have done um, some um, charity events in the form of um, trivia nights for Breast Cancer New Zealand. Um, so I could probably maybe share some knowledge. I'm I'm no expert, but um, yeah, I've, I've done a few.
Yeah, because we have a, you know, like I said, we hold a tournament every year, um, and it basically goes to um, goes to two different charities. But um, the women's version is is breast cancer, and obviously it's a it's a big tournament. We've got um, we've got four. Uh, well, actually, no, it's more than that. We've got at least six um, diamonds going for our premier level, um, and just um, you know the amount of you know it'd be good to I guess get more exposure because it's for a good cause. Um, but also, you know, as most of you guys know, it takes a lot to run events like this. Um, and we tend to get a little bit of burnout, as I'm sure everybody else does, in um, getting the same volunteers year after year after year. Um, you know, so it, it would be good to maybe try to try to work this out to see if... if <laughs> we yeah, can. if you want to reach out to me, I mean, we're we're struggling with exactly that this year as well. We have a week-long secondary schools tournament coming up in late August, September. Um, currently have five volunteers okay. for 120 yeah. teams of netball players. Oh, so, um, yeah, we, I mean, we're struggling too. So maybe um, some hats could go on together. We, we had um, the Cadbury volunteers... Um, group at our courts on Saturday trying to rope in volunteers. Um, only got a couple of names though, so um, wasn't um, hugely beneficial for the four or so hours that they spent there. But um, yeah, may maybe you know we can talk and see what we can come up with together. If you want to reach out to me, my email address is amelia.chambers at hpnc.co.nz. I'll pop it in the chat as well. Please. Um, yeah, Stephanie, we yeah, can probably I'll, I'll uh, yeah, uh, we can connect offline. Um, Chow just messaged me before he left. He had to rush to a football training, but uh, his message was that he's happy to uh, work with you to try and generate some volunteering opportunities for his community. He's quite active in that region as well, so I'll definitely be connecting. And I have a few other ideas for you, so uh, we'll talk offline about that. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Back awesome. to you, Rory. Sorry, Sam, can I just add in there, because obviously we same area. Um, we, we're quite lucky we've got four co colleges very close, you know, around Howick and, and McLean's, Pakarang and Howick and Botany. Um, a lot of their Year 13 students uh, are involved in, in events and activities, and I know we've used some of them before um, for things that we've done. Um, so it's always worth reaching out to them. The other, the other one, I think, in the area, there's about six scouts and venturers groups. Um, and they're also always looking for opportunities to, you know, for kids volunteering, helping, doing community service uh, and that kind of thing. And then you've also got volunteers, is it AucklandVolunteers.org or something like that? So Auckland Volunteers, um, you know, they, they have a list of events that, that people can volunteer for. So it might also be worth, get, get, you know, giving their charity events and big events, um, having a chat to them and, and getting an event profile put up on their, their website as well. I'll also add to that, I'm involved with Sancta Maria College. Um, they um, run a program for all of their students, which is about service to the community. Um, and they expect all of their students to give service to the community in some way. Um, so you could um, probably reach out to them as well and find out if they have any students that might be interested in volunteering. Um, for different things, just let them know what you're looking for and they'll just put it out to all of the students to sort of see if if anyone's keen in that particular area. Awesome. Thanks heaps for that, guys. Um, Sam, if you could just jump over to the next slide, please. Cool. And, ju and just, just wrapping up and in a with a massive thank you for you guys um coming on to the call this evening um as as we always say definitely appreciate you guys giving up your your time to come on and, and join the conversation and and contribute um there's already been so much stuff that's and and value that's been um shared within um you know the group tonight um and it's a testament to you guys and, and the work that you guys do um outside of you know your day jobs and your other life um you know all for the for the passion of, of both your community and your sports so um, massive thank you to you guys um around next steps if hubbing is is the route that you're interested in or you just want to go and check something out um here's a link here um to the 
hub guide from Sport New Zealand. Really, really cool tool and resource that's um, been developed for the last couple of years from Sport New Zealand and would definitely um, recommend checking that out if, you, if you've got time or if, or if that's something you're interested in. Um, and then another thing, like we keep saying, you know, if you've got any questions, get in touch with us um, uh, and we'll try and do our best to connect you in with, with whoever's, um, whoever we can and, and point you in the right direction. Um, I think Sam's put together a quick poll um, that should pop up on your screen. Um, it's probably like three clicks. Um, it'd be much appreciated if you could um, just quickly go through and um, answer against these questions. Um, should take about you know, 20, 30 seconds um, and then we'll wrap things up from there. Cheers. Thank you. All right, so um, yeah, that's it. Everybody's bold, Rory. So um, very uh, good. All right, well, um, we might call it there. Um, again, thanks heaps for jumping on. Um, really appreciate it. And um, if today, you know, didn't prove the value of of working together, I don't know what what will. Um, you can't really do it yourself anymore. Um, we always need each other. So um, thanks heaps and. Um, Hope you have a safe evening and uh, hopefully see you another time. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.